Happy Sabbath. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, from wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for setting time aside to be part of this wonderful Bible study, our uh, Sabbath school lesson. Today we are on lesson five, the testimony of the Samaritans. Just a reminder that our um, our lesson this quarter is themes in the gospel of John. Basically, we are reading through the book of John. We're not doing it um, in a, a chronological way, like chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, but we are reading the book of John, and that is really the most important part. Today, we are going to really dwell in the book of John, chapter 4, and we are going to see who are the Samaritans and what was their testimony and really what just happened in John chapter 4. I'm joined by my wonderful uh, team uh, who are going to lead us through study this study before they tell us their names and what they'll be taking us through. I'll ask that Onsongo, please pray for us. All right, uh, let's begin and pray. Our kind and loving Father and Master, we thank you and praise your name for everything that you've done for us thus far and leading us, dear Lord. And now, as we're about to look at this wonderful theme of your encounter with this Samaritan, I pray once again, may you enlighten our minds and illuminate uh, and animate this story that it may come to reality in our minds and we'll be able to see you at Jacob's well. And like that woman at that well, dear Lord, I pray this day, may we partake of that water which she was able to partake of as we go throughout this lesson. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, starting just with you again, uh, please tell us your name and what you'll be taking us through. Uh, my name is Onsongo, Rafael Nyamisoa. I'll be taking us through, uh, Sir, Give Me This Water and the Revelation of Jesus. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is Kola Marion and I'll be taking us through the woman at the well. Amen. Happy Sabbath. My name is Ted Langat and I'll be taking us through the testimony of the Samaritans. Happy Sabbath. My name is Mogere, and I'll be taking us through the setting of the encounter. Amen. Clearly, it's going to be one interesting lesson for today. And just like a reminder or like a further reading for all of us, just to help us understand the lesson better, we are reading some of the chapters in the book the desire of ages and like for today we are going to look at the woman at the well at jacob's well you know uh please you can as you read your lesson you can enjoin it with the book desire of ages written by ellen white to help you further understand this lesson so now the testimony of the samaritans a memory text comes from the book of john chapter 4 verse 42 i'm reading from the new king james version it says then they said to the woman now we believe not because of what you said for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. As we go through this lesson, we will put it into context. Who are these, and who is this woman that is being spoken about in this verse? Um, I know we've heard of songs like the woman at the well, I was seeking of things. You know that song? So as we even study, please have that song in your head. Uh, it's not really going to be our center of study, but again, this study just reminds me of that song. We, who are the Samaritans? That's a question maybe you've been asking yourself. So now we're going to go through some little a bit of history to just understand who are the Samaritans that are going to testify in this lesson. The Samaritans happen to, ha to be as a result of, you know, when the Northern Kingdom of Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians, their land was basically just invaded by other people. And it was not just other people but very many because even uh, the Assyrians didn't just stop at invading their lands they ensured that they spread captives all through that empire and other uh, slaves from other nations were also brought there so for example Kenya now is invaded and after the invasion some of our people are taken out to other places and then some remain here and the invader in this story brings other captives to stay in Kenya, you know? So I'm, I've said, for example, <laughs> just trying to ensure that we understand. And that is how the Samaritans were 
that is now the beginning of the Samaritans, you know, and they practice their own form of Judaism. Now, the problem with that is that it brought with it conflict. They looked at uh, the Jewish community, the pure Jewish community looked at them with a lot of disdain. They looked at them as the lower class people. Like, you know, you are, you are Jewish, you have some blood of Jewishness in you, but you are not really, really true Jewish people. And that animosity uh, lingered for a very long time. And even now, when you are preaching, we are learning about it, it is still lingering. And that is why we have the testimony of the Samaritans. Um, their relationship was totally, totally not good. They built their temples too. They tried to do things like it was like a parallel uh, community of the Jews. There's the Jewish community, but there's the Samaritan, which is really just the parallel. I pray that we have understood where this Samaritans come from. So now John is about to recount to us the encounter between Jesus, the woman by the well, and the people of Samaritan city of Sica. And that is really our uh, focus this week. The encounter of this woman with Jesus and eventually the people of Samaritan. And we want to see what really Jesus did with these people. Now, the first place is the setting of this encounter of Jesus, the woman, and eventually the Samaritans. What happened? What is really this setting? Thank you very much, Ramona. And to just take us all uh, through the setting of the encounter, um, I think it is helpful as we go through this part that we understand and answer two questions. And one is what is the issue that leads Jesus to actually pass through Samaria? Because we have learned that they were bitter enemies with uh, the Jews. So what leads Jesus to pass through Samaria? And the second question is also a bit more to you know, bring more color to the issue between the Jews and the Samaritan. And how to answer these questions, uh, we will go to the Bible in the book of John. Um, chapter 3, and we'll read from verse 26. I will read. It says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And I think the clincher there is in verse 30, which says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And so what is going on here? To build a little more context behind this is, as we were reading even from last week's lesson, there was the witness of John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist, you know, was, you know, setting the scene for Christ to come, he has come and his disciples have started baptizing many more people. And, and really, uh, you know, everyone has realized, has come to the realization that John was preparing the way for the Messiah and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And as this is happening, uh, you know, there's a lot, you know, the, the, in, in certain ways, and I think it happens also in our experiences, that there is sometimes conflict in ministry where, you know, John, in this case, John is losing popularity and he had his own disciples and now Jesus is gaining a lot more popularity. He's baptizing more people. And so a conflict sort of arises. And when we start the scene of, of, of the story of the Samaritan woman in chapter 4, it says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. You realize here there's a conflict. We get exposed to the first conflict that sets the scene for us. And it's the conflict between the disciples of, you know, uh, John the Baptist and the issue that was going on with Jesus. And the Pharisees come to a knowledge of this because the verse starts by saying the Pharisees. And really, there is potential for conflict here. And Jesus, in avoiding that conflict, would, which would further damage ministry, he leaves and goes to a different city. And a quote from The Desire of Ages I would like to read that, 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 that shows something around the spirit of Jesus is that this ministry is not really about one man. It is the work of the Lord. And so um, the quote from 
uh, Desire of Ages, chapter one, uh, you know, page 182 and paragraph 2 says, The work of the Lord is not to bear the image and superscription of man. From time to time, the Lord will bring in different agencies through which his purpose can best be accomplished. Happy are they who are willing to be humbled, saying, as John the Baptist, he must increase, but I must decrease. And so that is what, that is the setting of the scene. And, you know, Jesus in realizing the potential of conflict, which would potentially damage the ministry, because the objectives were the same between John the Baptist and Jesus. He sets off and he goes to a different place. And this place that he goes to, um, you know, he decides to go to Galilee, but first he must pass through Samaria. And when he passes through the city of Samaria, he goes on, you know, with his disciples and they get to Jacob's well, which is in the place called Shechem. And in Shechem, Shechem was about 1.5 kilometers from the city that you've introduced us to, the city of Sikar. And the woman comes into the story. And um, I'd love to read from verse uh, 5 to verse 9, and then I, I will uh, share a few lessons and then we'll close it for the Monday part. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sika, near the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The woman, a woman of Samaria, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of, from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And this comes, you know, this one brings us to the, to, the, to the second question that we were trying to answer, and which is, what is the fundamental issue between the Jews and the Samaritans? Jesus has passed through Samaria, and he's gotten to a well, and he's hung, you know, he's thirsty, and he asks for a drink. To many of us, that seems like a very normal interaction. But what really was the undercurrent? What were the dealings here? And the, I would also read still from the book uh, Desire of Ages to show us what the situation was between the Jews and the Samaritan. And the words that are used there in uh, page 182 and paragraph 2 is that the Jews and Samaritans were bitter enemies. And as far as possible, they avoided dealing with each other. To trade with Samaritan in the case of necessity was indeed counted lawful. Like even out of necessity, even out of like deep hunger, it was when it was considered a necessity, that was when it was lawful. But all social intercourse between them was condemned. A Jew would not borrow from a Samaritan nor receive a kindness. Do you know how bad uh, the, the spirit needs to be between two people for them not to even borrow something uh, from, from each other? And this was the situation here. But Jesus, you know, and, and I know, you know, the lesson for us is that within even the church, there are, you know, maybe communities or there are people that sometimes we are not in good terms with this conflict that exists that puts us in bad blood with other people. But how do we deal with these people? In a situation like this where the Jews and Samaritans had no dealings, had no conversions, did not even wish to borrow from each other, Jesus sets a scene for what it looks like to interact with someone who's of a different um, opinion, a different uh, you know, situation or a different context than we are in. And I'm happy to hand it over for us to have the broader conversation about what Jesus talks about with the woman at the well. Thank you. Thank you, Mogere, for setting us to the setting of the story. I'm really grateful for that. There's just something that you brought out that these people hated each other so much that they couldn't even borrow salt. So you'd rather eat a saltless food, <laughs> but not borrow it from Samaritan or Samaritan to the Jewish. And I think that thing still exists to date. The sad thing is that we are Christians. And what are some of the taboos in our cultures that you think could hamper um, our witness to other, because this is really hampering their relationship. How do we learn to transcend to transcend them? Um, uh, someone wish to answer that? Uh, some of the taboos that in our culture that really hamper their gospel. I, I think uh, it's a very relevant question. And I think maybe I would try, try and uh, personalize it to the Adventist context. In our Adventist context, we have certain cultural um, norms and, and, and understandings of things. For example, I know there are people who, in their reading of the Bible, they believe that women cannot take up positions of leadership 
in the church and as a result therefore it hinders also sometimes some women who may feel they can do much more for God but they are not given the opportunity because of uh, these perceived um, uh, misinterpretations of scripture which now uh, in, in essence uh, renders women as being present to be seen and not to be heard, not to participate. And so it limits sometimes, uh, um, let alone we see um, at, the, at the beginning of the f formative years of this church, God even using a young lady with very little education, the name of Ellen White, and many others um, in, 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 in giving out spiritual instruction. And, and sometimes some of these very men who speak down on women are quoting from her books, you know. And so and uh, that, that could be... Uh, a cultural thing in our setting for others it could be because you have reformed and somebody else has not reformed therefore you view them as as being lesser uh, in terms of their spirituality and in terms of their commitment and work with god and the, all these uh, impairs our witness towards them and and how effectively we can reach to them these are barriers that we need to we need to break and uh, we shall see uh, some of the means by, by which christ prescribes for us to be able to break this uh, cultural and social norms that we may have um, uh, created knowingly or unknowingly and also sometimes also inherited. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I pray that if you've been having some of the taboos, like you are allowing taboos to stand between you and ministering to the children of God, may we be transformed, may we be reformed from them, may we just lay these things down and focus. Like, you know, Jesus is walking away because he's seeing a potential, uh, potential conflict, a potential um, fight happening. But the objective is really spreading the word of God. So will you let that suffer because of the prejudices, because of the cultural uh, things that you have held on to so much? We move to the next part, which is actually the woman at the well, who is really just our main character of this story. Marion. Thank you, and I will just be picking up swiftly from where they've left. Um, so now we go deep into the story. Uh, we are introduced to the woman at the well. I know it is not uh, a new story to us. It's one that is known to us, actually. And maybe a few interesting facts that I found is um, what the precedence that was set in saying that Jesus felt the need to pass by Samaria. And I can imagine the conflict within the disciples because they had lived in this prejudice and this bias of against the Samaritans. But for Jesus, um, I think in present day we would say he was not afraid to to get in the midst of the conflict. He's not averse to it. And so I believe even in him uh, setting his heart towards going to Samaria, I think he wanted to bring out the, the fallacy, if I can say that, of the th things that they had held dear to them and had created this level of bitterness between them and set this uh, uh, division amongst them yet they were brethren, as we'll see even further into the story. And so when we talk about the woman at the well, um, in beginning also, I find it interesting, you can almost see the humanity of Christ flash through his divinity. And what I mean by that is his capability to, to feel thirst and to experience hunger. And you can see even the writer is very categorical in stating that it was at the noon, it was at the sixth hour, I believe. Uh, so that was around noon and you know the sun is hot and he had been worried because he had walked all the way from Judea. And we can see our savior that he, he's now sat at the well and he desires that he may, in the, he may find a cooling effect from the water that is at the well. But we see he had, he had no pitcher to, uh, or rope to reach the well because it says uh, that was at Jacob's well. It was a very deep well and it, um, it needed for you to have a rope and be able to, to get water. And so we introduced to a woman who at this hour comes to fetch water, as I would say was her, her custom. And Jesus uh, in kindness asked, uh, give me to drink, and the water, and the and the lady is taken aback, um, uh, because he, 
she can clearly tell that this is a Jew and of course we've talked about the prejudice and the bias that existed between them and she does not know how this man can ask of water from her. And so the story continues. This now, I'll just paraphrase because we want to read. This is from John 4, from verse uh, 7 to verse 15. And he goes on to say, um, like verse 10, John 4, verse 10, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given the living water. I like how uh, when you read Desire of Ages, it kind of takes you to the very present, uh, the interaction between Christ and this woman. Because you can see almost in a way, um, she tends, if I will say, to pretend not to understand what he's saying. But eventually you, you can see she begins to open up to the Savior. And you will also even later see, you know, when she tells, Christ, that you, you, you are a prophet. How, how do you know of, of the things that happen in my life? And so the conversation continues. And in verse 13, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst, uh, shall thirst again. Now speaking of the water at the well. But whosoever drinking, drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It's a beautiful lesson. And just maybe two takeaways that I get from the story of this woman is, one, uh, we make shipwreck of our faith and our Christian experience when we seek for satisfaction at the systems of this world. This woman truly had a need, and the Savior was able to know that from the interaction that they had had, and even prior to even the woman coming to the well. Because later on we'll see when Christ tells her, you know, go call thy husband and come hither. I will not touch on that, on the, on, on, on that day. But um, what the writer wants us to understand from this story, one would be that how many souls are thirsting today, close by the living fountain, yet looking far away, for the wellspring of life. When you read Romans 10, verse 6 and to 9, it talks about, um, just to read a couple of verses, it says, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the, the deep, that is to bring up Christ from the, from the dead. The Lord is nigh, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Do you truly believe that? It says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And this was the experience of this woman. At first, she had, it had not been revealed to her that she was actually had, she had the privilege of meeting the Savior and to have a one-on-one -on -one experience with her. And so that is the message for us, that to any thirsting soul today, the living fountain has been made available for us to, to drink from. And it is not of a drink that we shall thirst again, but uh, that we shall thirst again, yes, but a well, uh, it will be to us a wellspring of, of life. A second lesson that we can learn is that he who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world, of, of, this, uh, of this world will drink only to thirst again. Haven't you found that to be true of our experience? Um, I think a certain writer says, man easily uh, uh, pleases himself with the pleasures of this earth when he has that longing within himself that he cannot satisfy. But it says everywhere men are unsatisfied. And that is true. We can see it in our present day today. The long for something to supply the need of the soul, only one can meet that want. And we know who that to be. The need of the world is the desire of all nations who is Christ. The divine grace which he alone can impart is as living water purifying, refreshing, and invigorating the soul. And so to any dissatisfied soul that has a deep longing for that which the world cannot offer nor satisfy, the Savior can do that to you as, she did for the, as he did for the woman at the well, and so will he satisfy you. Amen, amen. As Jesus did to the woman at the well, so he's so willing to satisfy us too. 
I love what the lesson writer does while telling us the story of the woman as well. He juxtaposed two people, Nicodemus, with who we studied in our previous lesson, and now we have uh, the woman at the well. It's a very uh, weird parallelism because there is a teacher of the law, and then there is this woman who has a very dubious character, and that is why she can't even come to draw water in the morning like the rest of them. She actually comes to the well uh, when everybody is going home, when it is the sun is coaching hot. That is when she comes to the well. And she asks almost the same questions as Nicodemus. When Jesus tells her, give me water, and then he, she asks, how can these things be? You know, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then can you get that living water? If we remember what um, Nicodemus was asking, he was asking Jesus, how can I be born again? Yet I'm an old man. With Christ, things that are impossible, they are, imposs they are possible with him. And the question that really I would love uh, Ted to come in quickly in a minute, uh, when you read the book of John, chapter, se chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, which I'll read, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is talking to people in these verses. How do we experience what he's promising here? Thank you. Real quick. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, as uh, Marion has talked about, we have a longing in our hearts. And I believe even from my own experience, I came to understand that we were made to worship. And if that soul temple is not filled by some, by whom is meant to fill it, we'll always have this yearning and thirst for something. And ideally, Christ is telling us for us to literally experience that true, conv the true conviction as the one he tried to point out to Nicodemus and also to the woman of the well, all these things come through him. But apparently, I love how it's uh, John here talks in verse 39, talking about that what he was speaking about was the spirit which was to come later. Ideally, showing us that uh, as we accept Christ, we are to also be changed. As, as later on we'll go over, you will see the conversion experience of this woman at the well. And this just shows us the way we can experience his promise is by first of all, as he said, those who believe in him. So first, believe in him. As difficult as it might seem, first, just believe in him and let that experience flow. Amen. Thank you so much. Now we move deep into the story. And sir, give me this water. Whose words are these? And then we talk about the revelation of Jesus. It's going to be a very wonderful transformation. Um, Marion has just introduced to us the like the prologue of the story. Like this is how it starts. Now let's get deep into it, uh, on Songo. All right, it's an interesting encounter indeed, uh, where Christ is meeting with this woman at noon. Uh, it's a time of uh, great hunger, and it's time of uh, it's an interesting time to come and fetch water. As the story will tell us, we'll see this is a woman who. When other women are cooking, when other women are serving lunch, she's now coming to, to this uh, to fetch water. Almost as if uh, she was somebody who was not well organized, uh, was not, uh, did not put her things together in order. But uh, as, as the story goes on, we realize that uh, as they're discussing with Christ, Christ tells, uh, tells her that uh, in verse 10, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says to thee, give me to drink, and he said, thou would have asked of me, and he would have given thee what? Living water. And so, uh, generally, from a physiological, even from a medical uh, perspective, from a scientific aspect, water is, uh, is, is vital for almost all creatures here on earth. When you're spe uh, specifically speaking to our, uh, about ourselves as human beings, for good, for proper hygiene, and even for nutrition, our bodies are almost 60% of our body's uh, weight is, is, is in water. And so, water is a, is a significant thing, and therefore, thirst is something that we, uh, as human beings, are familiar with. In fact, we're told, I think, uh, you can go for days without water, without food, rather, but um, without water, then perhaps even like three days will be difficult for you. And so, um, this woman has a real need. Uh, and what she desires is, is true. 
But now Christ comes and offers something that he calls what? Living water. And this marvels, she, this, this woman marvels at this and she, and she asks, you have nothing to draw in and, and this well is deep. Then from where can you do what? Get this living water. She identifies that this living water is not in this well. She's been there before. You know, she's come here and, uh, and she's always been thirsty. She always has to come back again and again. And so she wonder, she's, she's asking herself, from whence then hast thou this what? This living water. And she even goes further and, and says, if this well, which was is such a great well, such a famous well, Jacob's well, a well with history, you know, a well with pedigree, a well that spans from the times of Jacob, and, 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 and it's a well that they, they prided on, it's something that they have inherited, you know. If Jacob's well, a wonderful well, a beautiful well, a well that has stood the, the test of time, maybe through many droughts, it, was, it, it always had water. If this well, you, which is very deep, uh, cannot be able to, um, to satisfy, then art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well and drank uh, thereof himself. You know, this is, the, this, this is the well of the patriarchs and the prophets. This is something significant. And lo and behold, you're coming and you're offering water that is better than water from Jacob's well. You know, that's, that's interesting. And, but uh, again, Christ comes again and says, not only did Jacob drink from it, but also his children and his cattle. You know, uh, this is a tried and tested uh, well, so to say. But Christ says, whosoever drinketh of this water shall do what? Shall thirst again. That this thirst will always come back again. But he says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him what? A well of water springing up into everlasting life. That this water, once you test it, this water makes you a well. This water makes you a well, and not only a well uh, that uh, will drown you and, 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 and kill you, but rather it gives, it brings life. It brings life. And not only just any life, but everlasting life. That's significant. Now the woman ans asks and says, Sir, give me of this water, that I thirst not, and neither come hither to draw. I will never have to come back here again at noon, and we shall see why this woman was coming at this hour. And the Bible continues and tells us that this was not only just water, but living water. And uh, it, 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 it espouses uh, that it wasn't something that was earthly. But rather, the lesson that Christ was trying to speak to her was that her thirst was beyond the material. Her thirst was beyond um, the, the things that this earth can, can be able to satisfy. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 25 to 27, the lesson author speaks to us about uh, quoting about Christ, Ezekiel writing about what the Messiah will do. And he says, then I will make clean water. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. What type of water is this that, can, that uh, cleanses not only filthiness, but also idolatry, idol worship, you know? I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and will give you what? A heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments. And do what? And do them. We see, in essence, what Christ was speaking to, was, was offering this woman, as, as similarly as his conversation with Nicodemus about being born again, was a transformation of the heart. And he, he, he says, the way to do this is to accept this living water. And in essence, this living water is Christ accepting him and his teaching and his instruction and by, uh, by extension receiving his spirit in our hearts. Then he, puts, uh, he removes the heart of stone and puts in us uh, the heart of what? The heart of flesh. And therefore we have this well of water springing up into everlasting life within us. But this, the text continues and uh, now this woman wants this water. He, she desires this water. But Christ wants to teach her that this water is able to satisfy her thirst, and he wants to point, pinpoint her thirst for her. And, in, and the Bible continues from verse six, 17, that Christ now, verse 16, Christ goes to the woman and says, Go call thy what? Call thy husband and come hither. And he's, he's, he's now going to the gist of the reason why this woman comes to the well at noon, when, when other women are, are, are preparing their homes. And the, Bible, and the woman answers and says, I have no husband. 
And Jesus says, speaks to her and says, Thou hast answered well, I have no husband. For thou hast had what? Five husbands. And he whom now thou hast now is not what? Your husband. In this thou hast said, I've, I've, you have said the truth. You know, this woman was trying to be, to be cunning. But even in her cunningness, she uh, unaware she had, she had actually said the truth. That uh, all these women, they were, they, you could be having men in your house, but they are not your husband. You see, that's something significant that Christ is telling her, that you could be cohabiting, you could be in a long, in a relationship that is long, but before heaven, this woman did not have a, a, a legally appointed, um, a heaven ordained and recognized husband. And so Christ is able to say, you have had five in the past, and even the one that you have right now is also not your husband, that you could be mated but uh, perhaps uh, not so in heaven. Not so in heaven. It's a significant uh, way. And this woman now realizes that this person that she's dealing with is not normal. Not only is he a Jew, but he has identified his life and the way he's been living. You know, this was a woman who perhaps was known for snatching people's husbands. Perhaps uh, she had a reputation, and for this reason she couldn't mingle with the rest of the women, and therefore avoided them. And for this reason she used to come to the well at noon, trying to uh, do her things discreetly, to move around without uh, being shamed and being scorned and being looked at, without causing a scene. Maybe somebody would attack her, having recognized her as somebody who tried to ensnare uh, her husband. And so for this reason, she would come to the well. And Christ is now offering water that will eliminate all these journeys to come to the well, you know, almost offering a tap in, a, in, an, in, an, in, a, in, an, in an age where there were no sinks and taps uh, that uh, p- channel and pipe water to their homes, Christ is saying, I can give you this tap. I can install a well in your heart. And so this woman desires this thing. But lo and behold, this Jew has told her her life history. This Jew has told her, she, was, she must have been wondering, am I so scandalous that the news of my, of, of my doings has spread all the way to, to Judea? It, 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 must, it, it, it surely isn't so. Surely isn't so. And so she, now in verse 19 she says, Sir, I perceive that thou art what? A prophet. I perceive that thou art a prophet. That this is not natural. Whatever, whoever I am, I am dealing with has got some uh, connection with God. Something divine um, is happening and it's only divinity that is opening up uh, uh, um, these things to this man. And so, therefore, we are now at the revelation of Jesus. Now she continues and says, once again, she, she keeps going back to our fathers. She says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you as Jews say that it is where? Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And now Jesus comes and tells, this, and, and tells her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh. When ye shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. And it continues and says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So Christ decides to play some theology with her. She wants to, to distract herself with theology, which is also sometimes a, a tactic that sometimes we use uh, when we are running away from the truths that are in our lives. Sometimes we throw theology uh, to cover the things that we are doing. We, we hide in the church, so to say. Not really uh, converted, still living lives of, lives of sin, yet still uh, handling high debates about the Messiah, high debates about where to worship, you know, and all these things. We can have external religion, but our lives are in shambles. We could be, have had five husbands and now we are on the sixth, but they are still not our husbands. This woman is equipped with the knowledge of the fathers and she, she wants to argue with Christ. And Christ plays along with her for a while and tells her, in essence, the Samaritans are wrong and the Jews are correct. But that is not important because the place of worship is not important. It is the way in which we worship, the heart with which we worship, uh, the background with which we come to worship. You know, she continues, he, 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 he comes and says, in verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the two worshippers shall worship the Father where? In spirit and in truth. You know, you could have the truth about the Sabbath. You could have the truth about the right way to baptize. You could have the truth about all these wonderful doctrines and themes uh, that we call the seven S's of, of, of Adventism. You know, the sanctuary, the state of the dead. You could have all these things. But the spirit with which we worship, is it the right spirit? Do we worship with the right spirit, uh, the, a spirit of humility, a spirit of obedience, a spirit uh, that, that humbles itself, a spirit that, um, that has surrendered totally and fully to God, which was the problem with this woman. Her problem was, was in truth, but her spirit 
you know, the way she was living. And her spirit was hungering and thirsting for, for truth. But she had sort of tried, uh, she was trying all manner of things to fulfill this hunger and this thirst through men. And, and through many things. And, uh, and men were the, were, the, were, the, were the vehicle, the proverbial, uh, um, the proverbial, in this particular case, vessel with which she fetched from the well of the world. And lo and behold, the first one was not enough. The f up to the fifth, up to the sixth, they were never enough. Because that, uh, that, 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 that space in her heart was created by God. And it can only be, full, be, be filled with a relationship with God. And therefore now Christ comes and reveals himself to her and tells her that indeed he is the living water. And he says in verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth. That God is not confined to buildings and to places, to rituals, to formalities. But whenever men and women are gathered together, whenever men and women are gathered together in a spirit of sincerity, in a spirit of honesty, in a spirit of humility, and they are seeking after God, he says, lo and behold, where two or three are gathered, I myself will be in the midst of them. And so it says these arguments about whether it is Mount Gerizim or it is in Jerusalem are not important. What is important is these Jews who had the right temple, these Jews who had the right doctrine, their spirits, their hearts were not correct. And these who were lost equally, though they had the truth uh, and they had the debates and they were arguing about this, Similarly, also them, their spirits in this, particular, in, in this particular context, the spirit of this woman was not correct. And so, therefore, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. In verse 25 now, eventually the woman now comes and says, I know, she continues once again, she's deflecting, she goes back to, script, to, to theology once again and says, I know that the Messiah will come. And, then, and he is called who? Christ. And when he is come, he will tell us what? He will tell us all things. He says the Messiah will come and he will answer most of these questions. And for the first time, something significant happens which has never happened in the whole, in the, in the whole of the four Gospels. Christ categorically identifies himself as the Messiah. Not to a great man uh, in, in, in the land of the Jews, not even a great man among the Samaritans, but not only a Samaritan, but a woman. You know, one he one who society looked down upon. Not only just any woman, but a woman with a reputation of snatching other people's men. You know, Christ would have chosen uh, almost like the most unlikely of persons to identify himself to as the Messiah. And, it, and I think it is significant because it is to such that the Messiah came. And so he rightfully identifies himself to this woman and he says, I that speak unto thee, I am he. I am he. And this is the revelation of Christ significant in the life of this woman in that Christ identifies with her struggle, Christ identifies with her thirst, Christ identifies with all these things that she has been, she had been trying, this life that she has been living, all this hiding that she had, she, that she had been doing. And eventually uh, he tells this woman, you need not hide anymore, you need not thirst anymore. Lo and behold, I am the Messiah. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am Amen. he who has come to give meaning and definition to your life in such a way as men have never been able to. I am able to give, um, to, to, to satisfy that longing and that thirst. And he says, I that speak to thee, I am the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Really powerful. That Jesus actually seeks to reveal himself to a woman with a very questionable character. It's, it's, it shows you the marvelous grace of our living God. The marvelous grace that is seeking us. Even you who feels like, I, I don't think Christ is seeking me. If he sought a woman who comes to the well at, in the middle of the day because, you know, she has bad things that she's doing, then what is it that Christ cannot do for you? What is it that you have done that Christ can't take you? The testimony of the Samaritans, this now leads us, you know, we've talked about the woman and the conversation with Jesus. And then what did this conversation do to her people? Before we get there, I just like, I love something uh, Onsongwa said, and Christ revealed himself to this woman. And last week we were talking about how Christ meets us at our spiritual level. And you can see that this is a clear testament 
that no matter where you are, whatever you're going through and whatever you've done, whatever the devil, the devil is telling you that you're not worthy or anything, trust me, we just read Christ reveal himself to somebody who we may not think he should reveal to himself to. And that's something it should give you so much hope in whatever walks of life you're in. Now, a quick interesting uh, fact is I love, uh, uh, I don't know if this is a comedy or, or something, but in verse, verse uh, 27, if you just read, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man asked, what seekest thou or what talkest thou with her? So I don't know if uh, Christ ever dealt with women or something, but I just liked how they, they really like, they, they, made, they made it like a highlight moment where it's like, okay, so like what, what's really going on right now? But in verse 28 where we're going to uh, go through the testimony of the Samaritans, you see that the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said, and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Literally, we have the conversion experience. We have already talked about how, how we experience these things is by, first of all, believing in Christ. This woman knew that Christ would come, as, we, as we've read in verse 25, that uh, the, the Messiah cometh and he's called the Christ. So she believed this is going to happen. We know, you know, and the moment she has that revelation of, or what we like to call it is... Um, a personal experience or a life-changing experience with, with Christ. How people usually like to term it, you know, how, how did you get saved? You know, I don't know what people like to talk about in terms of, you know, maybe I got in this big accident and I was healed. So I, you know, we all have different uh, stories about it, but we can see that from a conversion experience, what the lady went to do immediately was to testify. Now, this is something interesting that... Uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, the moment you experience Christ, you cannot keep your mouth shut. I've experienced this before, and I used to hear it, and when it happened to me when I had that experience, I could not keep my mouth shut. I was always talking about it, always trying to show people the grace that I have seen and how far I was and how much God loves me. And, you know, this is such an amazing act because you see the power of testimony. In this entire, uh, from verse now 30 to 42, it talks, Christ come, or the men now come, in verse 30, you see that now, then they went out to the city and came unto him. We've already seen the first effect of testimonies. Uh, in the book, Messages to Young People, Illinois tells us that uh, even if we go through trouble, we are not to come and tell our friends our trouble. You're already going through stuff. So am I. I'm going to add more to you. I know people like to talk about ranting, but she says that if we can be talking of testimonies. The things, instead of the trouble, the things we have seen God do in those moments. Those are the ones that actually make much impact into our lives. Because you can see in verse 30 what exactly happens with the power of testimony. Verse 30 says what? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Mogheris talked about the reason why Christ uh, retreated or retired to passed through Samaria, uh, uh, Samaria after the entire conflict was, at the end of the day, his main mission was to come and, um, you know, spread the gospel and, and to the message of salvation. You know, at the end of the day, that's, that's the main important point. And I love how when the disciples come and tell him, you know, he is meat. In verse 32, he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. At the end of the day, he's still trying to show us the most important bit is that living water that he comes to give us. And you have seen that this urgency of spreading the gospel, how important it is. And most of the times we think that spreading the gospel is literally all about, I come and I you know, tell you all the verses in the, in the Bible, word to word, word to word. But I love how we have been really shown the power of testimony. Because you see that all these things that happen in our lives, and we believe in Christ, and, we, and it has come to pass, and you have seen that this is God. This is a literal direct response that can actually help somebody come to Christ, as we've seen in this verse. And later on, we see that uh, in verse uh, 30, 39, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So now you see, not only does testimony affect somebody one-on-one, -on -one, 
but this person can relate literally if if i know ramona and, she, and i have known her and she tells me you know this happened i've been praying for this and man this happened and i'm i thank god i've been praying for this if i was going through something that would really uplift me to want to even pray more because it's not really about the aspect of competing with somebody on whose blessing is going to get faster than the other person but i think it's the entire aspect of pointing everyone to christ that he's the one who can satisfy your needs and by spreading that testimony you actually impact real time you know i'd say feeling or it 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 relates with our pain if i tell you man i've been praying for a job for 2 years and you're just in your first year looking for a job and i told you i got mine and i've been praying about it it will literally encourage you then if i tell you man me i've been looking for a job for 2 years it's tough out there you know you know but if i tell you the testimony of what christ has done during this experience it actually changes someone's heart and verse 40 this is where i want really to 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 highlight so when the samaritans were come unto him they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days now we've talked about how the jews and the samaritans were of different calibers they were not to 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 mingle with one another in the jewish uh in their culture it was it was a must for you to respond good to good like if you do something good to me i will welcome you with open arms so you do the same and to do that to other people it was more of inviting uh alien people into you into your into your thing you know and we again see that you know Christ breaking boundaries to show us the matters of salvation is about conversion of the heart and you can see as um we're talking about how the taboos are we so held back by the taboos even not only every time we talk about this thing we always see you know SDAs and people who has but, but literally Christ said spread the gospel from Je- from Jerusalem. He didn't say go start from there those people who don't know he started from from here because he understands it's about a conversion experience. So even amongst ourselves we do not show we do not reciprocate exactly what Christ did here. The aspect of he came he gave the good news regardless of who these people were. And when these people received him and they said you know come and abide with us he did so. No social barrier, no nothing came apart and this is something that should actually motivate us even as Christians everyone here who wants to go to heaven you should literally look at this so much deeper because we are so uh we are so quick to look at your brother's splinter in the eye and we forget the log that is really huge in our eye something to really think about but i love about this is that what happens in our lives is the things that happen should actually be used to spread the gospel. You may not be, you know, well versed in scripture or prophecy or anything, but if you believe in Christ as he said in uh, John 7 as we read that 738 that you believe in him you receive that living water. You receive that conversion experience. You experience it and that is something you are to pass on to your fellow brother and sister. A quick uh example of uh a testimony We know of the centurion and he had not seen the savior in the book of Isaiah chapter 32 real 32 real quick he had not seen the savior but the reports had heard of him and it inspired his faith this is somebody who was not Jew but you can see what testimony of what hearing of what God has done to other people's life can actually do and you can see that later on this man did not even want to see Christ he just wanted Christ to say heal him he will be healed so this is an example of what the power of testimony can do and this i just i just want to urge you we may be going through a lot of trouble us here you as well we are all going through life as paul said each one of us believers are going through it but despite every moment despite any trouble and anything we always overcome because we have christ and as you believed him we will face every challenge with him and you will come victorious do not forget to share it with your brother and sister we all need to be together as one church Amen. We are coming to the end of our discussion and the title of our study has been The Testimony of the Samaritans. And we've seen through one woman, the testimony of one woman. She didn't go with a Bible. She didn't go with any Bible verse. She didn't go with any SOP quote. She just went with her testimony and it was powerful strong enough to make the people of Samaria Samaria stay with Jesus for two days 
We are not told if they had to go to eat or do what, but they stayed with Jesus for two days, learning from his feet, learning of his truth. It's been a very wonderful discussion. At this moment, I'll ask the panelists just one second each because time is far much gone to give us like your final thoughts of this uh, lesson that we've had this week, starting with you, Ansongo. I think uh, one, mo one most relevant uh, uh, lesson is that Christ came uh, to seek and save the lost. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, uh, Christ is a relational Christ. He's a relation relational God in that he is not simply confined to a day like the Sabbath, a building like the church, but rather he is that living water that you can take with you. Not only, you, cannot, you shouldn't only have spiritual experiences on Sabbath when you hear a preacher speak, but rather you can, he, he, can, he goes with you home. Mm. He is with you on Sunday, he is with you on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and eventually even on Sabbath again. And so that's the a, that's a lesson that he was, I find that he wanted to impart to that woman and to us today that with him then we need not go to the well every single day, but we take the well home with us. Amen, amen. Um, my greatest lesson from this would be, and it's imperative for us to remind ourselves oftentimes, is that every human resource and dependence will fail. The systems of this world will be emptied. But in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, we can find an inexhaustible fountain from whom we can drink and drink again and ever find a, a fresh supply. And so may we depend upon Christ who has who is the fountain of life. Amen. Amen. Uh, to me, this is a bit uh, personal. I hope it will be personal to you too. But I know we all have our guilty pleasures. We all have our shameful moments. We all have those things that we might seem are not so righteous beyond other people's eyes. But this is quite a very clear illustration that Christ does not care about all that. He can meet you where you are. And it's still a same call that he still does this every time. As you've seen the woman at the well, the moment he heard, or she heard, sorry, she believed and she wanted that conversion experience. So I pray that whatever we, that's something that it really hits me, that, but whatever we are going through and we have those hidden things that we think the devil is telling us we're not worthy of Christ, he's a living fountain and he, see, he, he wants you to seek him wherever you are. Amen. I think for me, the one lesson is that the Samaritan woman said of the Messiah. Mm. The Samaritan woman knew of the coming of the Messiah. The Jews only thought that the Messiah would come and save them from Roman rule. But here was a woman in a different country who knew the Messiah was coming to save. We live in a world that has conflict divisions and people who, you know, we sometimes don't even reach out to because we think they have different belief systems from us. There's one need of the world, and that is the de Jesus Christ, who's the desire of ages. He who will give us uh, living water that we may thirst no longer. Everyone in this world needs him, has a space in their heart for him. So wherever you are, reach out, share your testimony with that other person. Amen. This testimony of the Samaritans is just a testimony that Jesus Christ broke barriers, broke the barriers that existed between the Jewish community and the Samaritans. So today, even you as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist, are you doing what this woman did? Because Ellen White says that she represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. That through her testimony, she was able to evangelize even more than the disciples of Christ. Yani, through her, just through her testimony, are you just comfortable seated in church every other Sabbath without evangelizing to your colleagues, to your family, to your neighbors? What is it that you do? Can you identify yourself as a missionary? As we have learned from this woman, you don't need much. You just need to believe in the Messiah. You don't need to cram the whole Bible. You don't need so many things to say, just your little testimony that you feel like, if I say this, who might be saved? Today, Christ is calling us to share our testimonies like this Samaritan woman for the better 
of this world, which is just like when Christ comes for the second time, we are all going to heaven. It's been a wonderful study. Join us again next week for another um, eye-opening study, another study that will make us search deep into our souls and see how are we going through this through many t more testimonies that you're going to witness next week. Um, at this point, I'll ask that Mogere, please close for us with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, what in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to study your lesson. May you impress these lessons in our hearts, and may you, may you give us an opportunity to reach out to those who are beyond our borders. It's our prayer. Make it our experience in Jesus' name.